Rahim. Uh, welcome to the Harbour Islamic Study Circle, Hisk Sira Session 168. Alhamdulillah. So we're going to start, inshallah, the conquest of Makkah uh, this week uh, and just finishing off uh, last week in terms of the lessons from the Battle of Mu'tah. Uh, so we talked uh, last time about that some of the scholars consider the Battle of Mu'tah to be a victory because the Prophet Sallam said it's a victory. Uh, and also because of the low number of Muslim casualties uh, and the fact that the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims uh, had some uh, ghanima or war booty. Um, other scholars consider the Battle of Mokta to be a defeat because the Muslims lost three prominent leaders, uh, being um, uh, uh, Zayd bin Haritha, Jafri, Abi, uh, Jafri bin Abi Abu Talib, and uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Rawaha um, and then in addition to that the Muslims were forced to retreat and uh, the Romans stayed on the battlefield and the primary objectives of the Muslims to seek revenge from the Ghatafan tribe was not fulfilled in fact the Muslims you could argue were outmaneuvered because of the number of uh, Romans and Christians that they had to fight other scholars say it's possibly a draw uh, because uh, neither side took any prisoners of war. The overall casualties on both sides was insignificant when compared to the total within each army and both sides returned uh, home uh, and neither side, neither the Christians nor the Muslims, uh, pressed home the advantage at the end of the fighting. Uh, but uh, obviously Allah's will uh, prevailed and uh, we get to see uh, some of the longer term consequences of the Battle of Mu'tah in as far as the Muslims are now psychologically prepared to fight Christians and expand ever northward beyond the uh, Arabian Peninsula and obviously the legend, this is where the legend of Khalid bin Walid and the Muslim army starts to spread um, and, and some of the uh, the exploits that Khalid did during the battle obviously uh, start to become uh, uh, things of legend reinforced later on however we did mention that uh, initially many of the people returning were criticized uh, for not uh, completing the battle or, or fighting to the uh, to death um, we also talked last week about how the Prophet ﷺ, uh, appoints Amr bin al-As as a leader for a follow-up campaign to Dada Salasil uh, about 300 people they went uh, to turn over more tribes um, but then they realized that uh, they need reinforcements and so uh, Umar sent for reinforcements uh, and uh, 200 extra reinforcements came. Abu uh, Ubaidah bin al Jarra was in charge of the reinforcements and they included Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar ibn al-Khattab um, but uh, Umar ibn al-As insisted on being the uh, leader of both the prayer and the army. And we talked about one of the other, a uh, couple of other fit issues where uh, Amr bin al-As did uh, Taymum uh, during uh, the night time before Fajr. Uh, so that's what we uh, did uh, last week. We didn't have time to do one final story, which the books of Sira mentioned happened before uh, the conquest of Makkah. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this before, so I'll quickly go over it again. It's about uh, Muhallim. Ibn Juthama, um, and uh, this is again was another small expedition uh, that uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ appointed uh, 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 Muhallim uh, Ibn Juthama as uh, uh, part of a group uh, to do this small <coughs> exhibition uh, uh, expedition. And uh, as the army was passing some of the other tribes. Uh, there was one other, there was a person, one of the other tribes called Amr ibn al bath And uh, he was uh, a secret Muslim. Uh, so he was a member of his own tribe, but he hadn't openly declared his uh, Islam. But when he saw the Muslims, he became quite happy. Uh, and uh, he came up to the uh, 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 Muslims, including uh, Muhallim, and he says, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, and um, uh, Muhallim, he had some sort of problem with uh, Amr uh, at, uh, at Bud, and uh, 
he didn't accept that salam. In fact, he turned around and uh, killed uh, Amr, saying, you are not a Muslim, and uh, then confiscated uh, the possessions of Amr bin al-Atbat, uh, and uh, justified it by saying, you know, he's uh, not a real Muslim. Uh, and then uh, uh, when uh, the Prophet uh, found out about this, uh, he was quite shocked and Allah revealed in the Quran, and this is why the uh, historians mention the story, uh, Allah revealed in Surah An-Nisa, verse 94, O you who have believed, when you go forth to fight in the cause of Allah, investigate. Do not say uh, to the one who gives you a greeting of peace, you are not a believer, aspiring for the goods of the worldly life. For with Allah are many acquisitions. You yourselves were once like that before, then Allah conferred his favour upon you, and so you should investigate. Allah is uh, indeed, uh, Allah, indeed Allah is ever uh, aware of what you do. So again, very important uh, things that we can learn for ourselves today, you know, the sanctity of Muslim life. Uh, and uh, the important thing that Allah reinforces here, if you're not sure, investigate, ask, you know, and especially in the, in the era of social media where it's so easy just to, you know, uh, get taken in by the hype and forward things which are sensational. Uh, the, 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 the lesson here is, is investigate, do your utmost to get to what you consider to be the truth. Here Allah is exposing Muhallim <coughs> as being somebody who uh, claims uh, uh, to uh, who just claimed that this person was not being uh, a, a, a real Muslim and his inner intentions were something very devious. He wanted, he obviously had this issue of beef with uh, Amr uh, for a while, but he wanted uh, to you know, follow through on that uh, beef. And then on top of that, uh, wanted to take his camel and his goods. And Allah exposed him in the Quran saying, you know, this is, uh, completely uh, unacceptable. So you know, you know, Muhallim he didn't do this uh, for for any other reason than personal greed, and uh, then uh, the this this issue comes up later on uh, in the Sira when uh, both tribes, uh, the the tribe of Muhallim and the tribe of Amr bin Al Atbat they want resolution of of you know this this uh unwarranted killing so the the the, the tribe of amr you know want revenge uh and the tribe of muhallim uh, they, uh, they 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 uh, don't want to uh accede uh, to to the demand for for uh, blood revenge and in the end the prophet Salam, he tries to negotiate between the two tribes and he then personally pays a hundred camels from his own uh, wealth to try and calm uh, the situation down. And the tribe of Mahallim then asked the Prophet Sallam, why don't you go and uh, why don't you ask Allah to forgive Mahallim? And the Prophet Sallam, he refused to do that uh, because of uh, what Allah had revealed in terms of Mahallim's um, uh, intentions behind uh, killing. Uh, and then it said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sh uh, some short time after that, Muhallim actually died. Uh, and then the, the, his tribe buried him uh, as, uh, as they normally would. Uh, then the next day they found his body on top of the, the, the ground where they buried him. And, and uh, his uh, face was uh, uh, facing downwards onto the ground. So that the body had come out and was laying face down on the grave. So then they buried him again, and then the same thing happened. The next morning, he is found to be on top of the grave. Uh, and so then uh, they, rather than reburying him, they took him out to some sort of valley area. And so rather than burying him, sort of they put him in, in sort of the, the bottom of the valley, and then just covered him up with stones. 
Uh, so it's not a proper burial, it's just uh, covering them up uh, with stones. And the Brother Sam, when he heard about this, he said, indeed, the, um, the earth covers up people much worse than him, than Muhallim. Uh, but Allah wanted to warn you through him by showing you the sanctity of life between you. So, you know, it's not, you know, we shouldn't be going around uh, wanting to, to kill each other, uh, wanting to kill other Muslims, especially for things like this. And this is a way that Allah used to reinforce the sanctity of life between uh, Muslims. So that, that's uh, another little uh, story. Um, now moving on to sort of what many would consider to be one of the pinnacles of the Prophet ﷺ's uh, life. Uh, and this is the conquest of Makkah. And again, we have to put this into context. This is where the Prophet Sallam, he was born, he grew up, uh, you know, he spent his first 40 years there as, uh, as uh, a youngster, married children, um, being sort of, uh, despite being an orphan, having, you know, a, a revered uh, upbringing. Not a privileged upbringing, but a revered uh, upbringing. Uh, then, you know, he was... Uh, appointed as a prophet and messenger uh, and then started to do the Dao and he, he thought in the initial years that his Dao would work he would get people to, to come over to the new message uh, and, and things would be okay because he's from noble stock uh, so he cultured a group of uh, Muslims around him his core Sahabi and then they started doing Dao in public but then the backlash happened and it was a severe backlash and, and, and you know, he had to send a, a lot of his uh, followers and, and close friends out of Makkah for their own protection. And they went to Abyssinia, including Jafar ibn Abi Talib, um, because of the, 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 the violent backlash from his own relatives. Yet he continues to do the dawah. Then they, they, they boycott him and then uh, the boycott ends and then he's still carrying on doing the dawah, then he loses uh, protection when his uh, uncle dies. Uh, and, uh, and then within a short space of time, he has to flee for his life and he sets up Islam in, uh, in, in Medina. But his heart, you know, he spent 50 years, over 50 years in Makkah. His, his heart is clearly there. And, and now he's built up, uh, he, he's built up, um, He's embodied the vision of what Islam is in, in, in Medina. Uh, and, and now comes the time for him to go back and uh, conquer Makkah and to you know, take over his, his city of birth. And to a chance to face off the people who had been ridiculing him, uh, wanting to kill him and expel him and plotting to, uh, against him and fighting wars against him. This was his chance to get back at them. But, but before we sort of go into that, you know, we need to uh, um, <clears throat> just go over a few sort of preludes to the battle. Essentially set the scene, the context. Uh, and, and this goes back essentially a, a, a number of generations. So um, it, it's uh, the, the, the reason for the conquest of Makkah is... Uh, a breach of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was a, a, a peace lasting uh, uh, for 10 years um, and in which either side could make uh, treaties and allies with other uh, tribes. And so there's two main tribes involved in the, 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 the breach of contract and they are Banu uh, Qaza, and uh, they um, uh, have a, um, a, uh, a history and allegiance with the Prophet and his tribe, and then there's Banu Bakr, which allied themselves with uh, the Quraysh. But we've talked before about Banu uh, Qaza uh, a few times, many, many months ago. Um, they are related to the Prophet ﷺ, and um, they've got a long link with Banu Hashim. So uh, 
going back to the time of Ibrahim al Islam and Ismail, uh, when Hajj and Ismail were left in Mecca, there was a, 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 a tribe that were uh, attracted to the water where uh, Ismail. Uh, feet had caused the, the, the well to uh, uh, to appear uh, through Allah's uh, miracle. And then that tribe was the tribe of Jurham. And so uh, we talked later on how uh, Ismail, he uh, married into the tribe of Jurham. And Jurham, they took him as one of their own. And so uh, uh, Ismail and his children uh, grew up in Mecca through the tribe of Jurham. But over many, many generations, hundreds if not a thousand years later, Jurham became weak, they became corrupt, they became evil, and they uh, uh, did bad things to the, the, the Hujaj, they stole money, they sort of uh, uh, overcharged, uh, and they were not worthy to be custodians of the, uh, the Kaaba. And then uh, the tribe of uh, Khuza, they essentially uh, kicked out the tribe of Jurham. And the, we talked about this um, on, on a number of occasions. The, the leader of the um, uh, Khuza tribe uh, was Amr ibn Luhay al Khuzai. And he's known and quite famous because he is the first one to introduce. Uh, idolatry into uh, Mecca. So he kicked out the the tribe of Jurham uh, and uh, Amr bin Luhay al-Khuzai. He's going on his um, trips, um, uh, business trips. He uh, comes across one of the tribes in Syria. He's quite impressed by them because they're... they're um, uh, the tall people, you know, the, uh, it, it's it's noted that they are, you know, compared to the Arabs, uh, uh, that they appear like giants, uh, and they say, well, this is because of their uh, their god Hubble. So he says, can I borrow or can I have one of your gods? And he brings back Hubble and he places it in pride uh, position out, uh, uh, around the Kaaba, and he's the one who introduces idol worship into the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and uh, that's the first of many idols, as we know, and that, that was uh, Hubble, and that was the main, the biggest uh, idol that the, the Quraysh had. And, um, you know, during the Battle of Uhud, at the end of the Battle of Uhud, Abu Sufyan, he's the one who says, you know, uh, Hubble be praised, Hubble be praised, uh, because they thought that they had uh, defeated the Prophet Salaam. So the, the, the tribe of Khuza, they're in charge of the Kaaba for a few hundred years. Then one of the Quraysh, from the descendants from uh, the Jurham, they want to take uh, the, uh, the Makkah back. And this is uh, the uh, Gilab's son called Qusay. And we talked before about the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, the son of who? The son of Abdullah. I need that. <laughs> Abdullah, the son of who was the Prophet's grandfather? Abdul, Abdul Muttalib. So Muhammad ibn uh, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, son of Hashim, son of Abdul Manaf son of Qusay ibn Kilab. So Qusay ibn Kilab, he's uh, the great, great, great grandfather of Prophet Salaam, going back uh, six uh, generations. He marries the daughter of the chief of the Quza tribe, and she's uh, Khubba binti Khulayl. So the, the daughter of the chief of uh, the Khuza, who are in charge of the, the Kaaba, uh, marries Qusay. Then when the chief of the Khuza dies, Qusay, he basically engineers a coup and he takes over the, uh, takes over the Kaaba and its institutions and he brings back the Quraysh. 
brings back the Quraysh, and the Quraysh and the, 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 the uh, Khuza have a power struggle, and the Quraysh expel the Khuza. But it's sort of, it, it's not, it's not, it's not a, a, a really, um, uh, it's not full of uh, enmity, the, the, the expulsion. They're still on sort of talking terms uh, because, of, you know, they, they had a lot of respect for Qusay. Um, so then obviously Qusay, you know, passes on uh, the, the custodianship to Abd al-Manaf and then uh, Hashim. But you've got uh, the Prophet being being uh, 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 directly related to the tribe of Khuzar. Uh, and, 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 and that's important because partly because of that, the tribe of Khuzar, they are allied to Banu Hashim. And they've been long supporters of uh, Banu Hashim. And that uh, it was reinforced by a treaty that Abdul Muttalib made with the tribe of Khazar. So after Qusay, there's Abdul Manaf, and then there's Hashim, and then there's Abdul Muttalib. He then uh, formulates another alliance with the tribe of Khazar. Uh, and, and that treaty basically says, as long as for, for all future generations, we will uh, permanently support each other. So that's... Uh, that's uh, you know why Khuza are allied to the the Prophet and they've been allied, you know, uh, through the the Hashemite links. And so, when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah happened, it was natural, despite the fact that the Khuza aren't fully Muslim, it was natural that they would ally themselves with the Prophet and this other tribe, Banu Bakr, which we're going to talk about. They would ally themselves with. Uh, the Quraysh, because they are pure idol worshippers, and they're one of the very few pure idol worshipping tribes left in and around uh, Makkah. So, uh, so then the Treaty of Hudaybia uh, happened. Uh, the the tribes uh, chose their sides, uh, and um, there's sort of like a a um, a code of conduct between the tribes, just in terms of. Uh, how they operate with each other in peacetime and in wartime. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, there was one occasion when uh, somebody from Banu Hadrami, a, a man from Banu Hadrami, which is allied to Bani Bakr, he was traveling in the Hijaz area and he uh, strayed into the territory of the Khuzar. So the Khuzar, they killed him and they took his money. So this is a, a man allied to uh, Banu Bakr, uh, from Banu Hadrami. So then Banu Bakr, they took revenge, and this is the, how things work, they took revenge by killing somebody from Khuzar uh, to avenge the death of, uh, of this person from Banu Hadrami. So then the Khuzar, they then uh, killed three of the leaders of uh, one of the, the family of Banu Aswad al Duali, and the, they consider themselves to be a noble family, the Duali um, family. So, three of their prominent leaders were killed by al Khuzar. Then Islam came, and then they made the treaties with, with either side through Hudaybiyah. Banu Bakr were with uh, Quraysh, Khuzar with uh, the Prophet. But because these things are in recent memory, there's still this animosity between uh, Banu Bakr and Khuzar. Uh, but they have to abide by the terms of the treaty. But then Banu Bakr, they decide to seek revenge for these three people killed from their noble family. Uh, and, and, and just to reinforce how uh, noble that these people thought they were. This particular family, the uh, 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 in from uh, Banu Aswad al Dali, they would charge double blood money. So, for unlawful killing of somebody in uh, the in in Arabia at the time, in Jahiliya time, and then the, uh, and then in the time of Islam, you would have to give a hundred camels if you uh, unjustly kill someone. Uh, but this, the, these particular people, they would charge 200 camels as blood money. 
So, so you can see why they particularly wanted to avenge the death of these uh, three uh, nobles. So then, the, uh, then an occasion came up where some of the tribe uh, from uh, Fuzar, they were near uh, uh, Makkah in a place called Al Watir, which is sort of a, 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 a waterworks uh, area, uh, watered area near Makkah. Uh, and so Bani Bakr, they thought this is the time to seek their revenge. But they knew that there was a treaty, so they went and they sought permission from the Quraysh. And they basically said, look, we want to avenge the death of these people. Uh, but, you know, we know you've got a treaty, but can you allow us to have this one nighttime raid? Uh, and it'll just sort of, you know, satisfy our thirst for revenge, despite the treaty. And it said that the, some of the leaders of the Quraysh, Sahail bin Amr, talked about before, Safwan ibn Umayyah, so the prominent leaders of the Quraysh, they agreed to this nighttime raid. They helped them with money. They helped them with logistics. They helped them with weapons. And they said that, uh, don't worry. <clears throat> if you do it at night, if you attack in the middle of the night, how will Muhammad ever find out that it was you or we, we, we were there supporting you? Um, so, so that was the plan. And it was... Uh, and they probably just had the intention of just doing a quick in and out, uh, you know, smashing grab raid almost. So they would go in, kill one or two people, grab a few camels, grab a few, you know, uh, other bits of booty, and then leave straight away. And uh, so on paper, they've sort of been seen to avenge the death of their nobles, but no real harm is done. Maybe one or two people have killed and sort of a few camels, uh, and, and sort of, you know, uh, things things would die down. Uh, and again, for these types of raids, it's, you know, uh, it, you know um, the sort of international law, the accepted norms of raiding is that, okay, if you are going to raid, because it's a, a bit of a, a, a law of the jungle or of the desert, is that you don't, you try not to kill people um, and you definitely don't kill women or children um and uh you know that that's that's how it happens but then when it got to the actual uh, uh time of uh fighting uh the leader from Banu Bakr his name was Muawiyah al nufail al duali so again he's from the family of the three noble people that died so Muawiyah uh, al nufail al duali he uh, gathers his men and they start to attack, but they had done it in such a clumsy way that basically the the tribe of Khazai, even though it's at night time, they get alerted to the 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 smashing grab raid. So then they sound the alarm. Everyone wakes up. There's panic everywhere, um, and all the men folk they grab their, uh, their their weapons and they start. Uh, defending themselves um, and um, uh, when oh, okay the, I mean the other thing uh, it said that when when uh, Muawiyah he was making these plans he went to the Quraysh he also went to some of the other le uh, leaders of Banu Bakr uh, and they refused to support him and they're basically you're, you're, you're on your own which is important because uh, uh the Prophet ﷺ, when he responded, he, he didn't sort of, you know, uh, sift out the response to only those people that were part of the raid. He said, you know, all of Banu Bakr is complicit in the attack, even though some of them said no. You know, so like, you know, nowadays we get situations where people go on marches or people vote against this, that, the other. But there's an acceptance, there's a collective responsibility when things happen. So the Prophet ﷺ, he's... He's using that collective responsibility approach to say, well, Banu Bakr is, is responsible and so are the Quraysh. Uh, so that we'll, we'll talk about that thick issue uh, later on, inshallah, uh, when we do some of the lessons. Um, so uh, so Muawiyah al-Nufail, he, he starts to attack, but there's panic, there's confusion. Uh, this is in the middle of the night. It's near this pond called uh, uh, Watir. Uh, the whole operation turns into a bloodbath a, a bit of a massacre and they're they're literally killing 
women and children and people are running away and they're chasing them. And um, it's uh, said that that uh, some people were act uh, that uh, actually ran specifically into Makkah because in the Haram in Makkah, you're not allowed to kill. So again, this was the established norms, the, the, the law of the land. We talked about this before. Not allowed to kill in the four holy months. Uh, and you're not allowed to kill in the Haram, the sanctuary of Makkah. Um, and so people knew that. So uh, a small group of people who were fleeing, they flee into the Haram. And they, they get into the Haram and they're now saying, we're safe now because you can't touch us. We're, we've physically crossed the boundary. We're in the Haram area. This is holy land where you can't kill us. But uh, Muawiyah, uh, he pursues those people. And then his own uh, tribes people, they, 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 they stop and they say, you can't carry on because that's holy ground. Uh, and he turns around to, and, and, uh, and says to them that, uh, um, or, or they're basically saying, you know, don't go into the harem, your God, your God, saying, you know, basically, uh, this is not allowed. Mu'awi al-Nafel, he turns around and says, today there is no God, right? You, you see no problems in stealing in the harem, uh, but when it's our time for revenge, you you stop. So he's trying to rationalize his evil. And we've all come across people like that who do evil things and they rationalize it. And he's rationalizing it by saying that you guys, you, you're, you, you're happy to steal and do other sins in the harem. But you, if you've already crossed the Rubicon there, then what's stopping you from killing? This is just another law to break. You're already committing haram uh, by doing that in the haram, and what you know, why stop? Why stop there? So he goes on and pursues those people, and he kills those people in the haram. So, so again, he's rationalised it. He's got to have he's got to have um, uh, blood revenge for for the people, uh, and uh, he, he sees it like that. Uh, but like I said, it's a grave sin even in their own laws, uh, to kill in the harem. So there's a massacre, it happens outside the harem, and there's a massacre that happens inside uh, the harem. So this is a complete PR disaster. So the, 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 the promise of a quick in and out victory, it's, you know, uh, it, 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 it didn't happen. So Bonu Bakr, they basically, they, they knew that they you know, where it shred up the the treaty. Uh, that wasn't their intention, but obviously that this is uh, how, how it worked. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nofal, who's the chief of the that particular part of Banu Bakr, he's the one who is personally responsible. So uh, another group of people who then, from Khuza, who are allied to the process, huh? They uh, go into uh, Makkah. They seek refuge in the house of someone called Badil bin Waraka al Khuzai. So he's a, from the Khuzai tribe, but he lives in Makkah. He's a prominent uh, uh, person in Makkah, and <clears throat> everybody knows uh, him, and especially the, the, the Khuzai people. So they seek refuge in Badil's uh, house. And we'll come on to the story of Badil in a couple of minutes, inshallah. And then as soon as news uh, leaks out, and maybe even the next day, that this is what happened, uh, one of the other prominent people from the Khuza tribe, Amr bin Salim uh, al-Khuzai, he immediately, uh, no, uh, uh, Amr bin Salam al-Khuzai, he immediately goes uh, to meet the Prophet because this is a clear breach not just of the contract but, but the breach of the norms not just of night rate but the, the the norms of society you just cannot do this type of thing uh, and so he takes a, a delegation of about 40 people Amr bin Salam to Medina and quite rightly they want revenge they want war they want this to go 
Uh, they don't want this to be uh, to go uh, unpunished. And if you've got 20 people killed, that is 20 times 100 camels is how much? 20. 2,000 camels blood money minimum is what they would need. And 2,000 camels is a huge amount. I mean, how many camels did they take on uh, to, to, to Mokhtar? How many camels did they take Battle Badr? You know, camels are, you know, in some of the, some of the, 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 the battles, you, you've got six people sharing the same camel, right? So, you know, uh, uh, you know for us, I mean, uh, the equivalent would be a camel is like, uh, you know, an expensive car. So you're saying, you know, uh, and, and this is later on, this is what the Quraysh said, if we agree to the blood money, it would bankrupt the Quraysh. Where are they going to get 2,000 camels? Uh, but Amr bin uh, Salam al-Khazai, he goes, he meets the Prophet with his delegation, you know, and, and you know, uh, um, basically, he then recites poetry and he you know he, he may have made it up on the spot you know he's had time to to compose it but in 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 this sort of long poem and that that's how they communicate that was the way that they would trend that's the way they would develop their hashtags that's the way they would get information out is by having really good and moving poems and poetry and that's why the poets were seen as being you know uh, the uh, were highly regarded in society because of this ability they were their top propagandists and media people were the poets so he's 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 devising this uh or a poem and he's saying to the brothers and basically we have a common ancestor your great 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 grandmother is one of us you are one of us right uh so we've got common lineage um didn't your grandfather make a treaty with us? Abdul Muttalib made a treaty with the Khaza. And we sent a, a group of us uh, to be part of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So they're a group of the, the Muslims from Khaza. They went to do the Umrah. When they, uh, they were prevented from doing the Umrah, they would then uh, were part of the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and the Pledge of Ridwan. And he's basically saying, look, Look at all these reasons you have to support us. And then he goes in to say what actually happened, right? So he's setting the scene and then he said, these people came and they massacred us. They killed us whilst we were in sajda, right? We had nothing to protect them. This was the haram, you know? So all of these reasons and he's laying it on, you know, thick. And then he's every right to lay it on thick because this is completely unacceptable. And so he's sort of given this, you know, really powerful explanation of why he is there with 40 people. He wants action. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he responded. Now, the question is, how did he respond? Did he say, leave it with me? I will set up an international conference and I will get together people and I will discuss how to how to do this. Did he say, no, let me write a letter to the Quraysh and say, naughty, naughty, naughty. Uh, did, he, did he encourage the Khazar to write to their MPs? Did he, in, did he say, let's go to the United Nations and pass a resolution? All right. Or should we go and beg the Security Council of the uh, United Nations to um, uh, write a harshly worded condemnation of this situation? Right. Should we send out a tweet that criticizes what's going on? He didn't say any of those things. Right? That's not how a leader responds to something like this. You know, we have, you know, we have what's going on in, 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 in China, in uh, Syria, in uh, uh, all places where there are committed Muslims, you know, and, 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 and the response is not what the, the, the response from the, our leaders is far from how the Prophet responded to something like this. When he heard about this massacre and the breaking of the treaty, you know, he didn't say, leave it with me, I'll get back to you. He just said, you have been helped. Right? So, you know, um, Amr bin uh, Salam al Khazai is coming. He's made this big, passionate speech. He's got 40 people there saying, demanding action. 
Protestantism just turned around and said, you have been helped, right? Um, and um, then, uh, you know, the, what one of the narrations says that, you know, if, if, um, if, I'm, if I don't help you, may I never be able to help anyone again. You know, just, it's just as like an, an, an Arab idiom. Obviously, I'm going to help you. He didn't say how, when, or what he's going to do. He just said, look, trust me, I will sort this out. I will get you a revenge. Leave it with me. Right? Uh, and then the Protestant sees a cloud in the distance. And again, you've got to think this is, this isn't the UK. <laughs> this is Arabia, you know, you know, clear skies a lot of the time. And then he sees a cloud and he, he says, uh, this cloud shows the victory of the Khuzar. Right? Uh, and again, this is what we talked about, how the Protestant of he is purposefully optimistic. And, you know, it's, it's, it's haram to be superstitious. We're not allowed to be superstitious. We don't believe in bad superstitions or bad omens or, walk, you, know, some, you know, breaking glass or walking under a, uh, a ladder or seeing a black cat. These things are pure superstition. What, and these are associated with negative things. What the Prophet specifically encouraged the Muslim mindset is to be optimistic and optimistic in Allah. You, you, you see something, you read in it positivity, and you ascribe that positivity to Allah, right? That is perfectly permitted, you know? So, I mean, you know, it may have just been coincidence there's a cloud, but the Prophet said, I interpret the vision, of the seeing this cloud as being a positive sign from Allah that you will get your help, right? Uh, and, and so those things are particularly allowed that we can think positively and again if we start to do that it really does change how you interact with your environment by seeing positivity around you thinking positively ascribing the good and the positive to allah you rewire your brain you 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 become a different person and it's really important that we we learn those lessons from how the Prophet uh, approach life be positive Put your trust in Allah, but put it in a positive way. We're not there blaming Allah for things. We're not, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, self-flagellating. We're not beating ourselves down all the time. It's having trust in the good of Allah. So seeing things, you know, uh, in a positive way, and then linking that to Allah. That's perfectly allowed in the Prophet He's he's uh, uh, showing that uh, to them. So the it said that the that, that the leaders of the uh, the, the Khuzar, uh Amr bin Salam they were essentially they you know gave three options either blood money uh, for the victims so that's two thousand camels uh, then uh, they need to terminate their alliance uh, that Quraysh need to terminate their alliance with Banu Bakr which would then expose them to uh, to war um, uh, or revenge. And uh, consider the, that the truce has been nullified. So the, these were the things. Thorazam said, all he said was basically, you've been helped, leave it with me. Uh, so that's the background to how the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah got nullified. The, 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 the next things, inshallah, we'll, we'll finish there now, but inshallah, the, you know, um, just to put that into the, the context is that basically the Prophet then starts to make preparations for war, doesn't tell people. Um, Abu Sufyan and the Quraysh, they're in a panic because they know this is a grave breach of the treaty and they're, they're already uh, psychologically uh, defeated. They dispatch Abu Sufyan to renegotiate the treaty with the Prophet ﷺ. And he comes back with a fantastic uh, response uh, to Abu Sufyan. And in fact, you have Abu Sufyan begging other people. He even goes and begs a child to intercede with the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, so we'll talk about that, inshallah, uh, next time. So Jazakallah uh, Khair for listening. Uh, do remember the Ummah and uh, myself in your uh, du'as. Uh, and uh, let's make dua that Allah provides us with the leadership that we need uh, in in uh, in today's troubling time. Inshallah, this one. Wala sir inna linsan ala fi khusr illa ladina amanu ba amanu swalihati. Watwasa bil haq, watwasa bil sabr, 
جزاك الله خير السلام عليكم